Well, I guess um, let me get started. So I'm Raj. Uh, I work here as manager of quality assurance here at Wolfram. Um, so before I get started with, with unit testing and how it has been incorporated into Mathematica, I hope that um, I keep the presentation small, concise, because I know everybody here had, has had lunches, and I don't want you falling asleep. Uh, you know, so. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, I'll try to keep it to the end so that you know I'll I'll have all the questions at the end. So um, going f going into unit testing, I mean, I guess the question of whether we have to do testing or not is uh, almost self-explanatory, right? Because I mean, everybody here who has ever developed software would know that, uh, as John put it in the uh, in the meeting today, if you have written code which is more than five lines of code, you know. There, there is every possibility of a bug coming up. And especially if you have software that you are develop, uh, developing over time, you want to make sure that it works with the initial cases that, uh, that you are developed it for. So um, uh, let me make a small mention about the previous effort. Uh, for people here who have used Workbench, um, you know, I mean, uh, long users of, of Mathematica and then Wolfram Language might have used testing in, in one sense, um, but there was no integrated way to convert tests from Mathematica to you know, plain text files, testing notebooks, or whatever, which you can use directly. So one of the um, long-standing features that, that we didn't have was you know, built-in testing into Mathematica. And with this, we have taken the first step towards correcting it. Um, I'll start off with the notebook interface, because I want to show you how you know we'll, we'll start with like a regular notebook which I'm sure everybody here is familiar with um, and how starting from here I can you know write my functions and from there um, I can convert them into tests run them you know check them etc cetera, etc cetera, play around with them and then finally save them uh, for later use you know so that we can quickly run the test whenever we want on demand be it in Mathematica be it in um, I don't know, Workbench or Cloud. Um, so let me just start off with a simple function. Let's say I have, I'm defining a function. I'll try to keep it pretty simple. Um, and now I want to have another definition wherein for if it's a string, I want it to do string length of x squared. Now, I mean, let's assume that this is my function. Um, and uh, you know, my quick test would be my function of uh, one, you know, whether it works, and then a few other tests. Is this too big? I should probably make it a little smaller. Right. Um, of ASDF, and then my function of right. So when most people uh, develop in, uh, I mean everybody's uh, familiar with the notebook interface. So uh, you know when you usually write your whatever function, I mean this can be super complicated, or you know you can call a package to load your functions in. Um, but usually you have some use cases. You know this is what it's supposed to do, etc., etc., etc. And uh, when you're writing it, you you test it around this way. You can create sections, uh, you know, all, all the rich functionality that is already there in the notebook inf interface, um, you know, subsections. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you can creep, uh, keep having my better function. Uh, let's say this takes two arguments uh, and does something pretty simple, right? Um, and I can have a few tests for that, you know. Uh, I mean, I can, you can make this notebook as long as you want. You can have as many cases as you want. Um, now from here, if there is a way to convert, to quickly convert this notebook into tests, you know, that's, that's going to be awesome, right? I mean, um, everybody gets to this step, but then till now, you would have to manually do some copy paste stuff or write your own parser or whatever to convert this into, um, you know, tests if you have used Workbench before. So now we provide a 
toolbar called as the testing toolbar. It's found in the Windows menu. So if you click on the testing toolbar, you'll notice that uh, if you can see it here, there is like this little button at the top. Clicking on that will automatically convert. It will keep all the styles, all the text, I mean, all the notebook interface functionality that's already there and convert it into a testing notebook. I'll make this a little bigger so that people in the back can see. Right. So um, now, uh, you can notice that there is little text here. I mean, this will obviously be more visible on your own machines. Uh, and this just reads input, and this reads expected output. Now, most of the tests have arranged, have been arranged in, you know, this is my input. This is what I expect it to return. And then you can have expected messages, too, saying that, you know, this, my input is supposed to generate messages for whatever reason. Uh, to quickly add tests, you can either just type in, you know, one by zero. Uh, it will automatically create a test. You could click the new button here and add tests that way, you know. Uh, I'm going to purposefully leave them blank. You know, I'm not giving them any ex unexpected outputs because I want them to fail. Um, clicking on the Run button at the top will run all the tests in the notebook um, in, in, in the order. So it's just like your regular notebook, wherein uh, all your definitions at the top will, will be carried through in, in each of the tests. Now, you can notice here that you know, um, there is these success bars, or what I call as test result bars. Um, there is something called details here, and if you can see all the way at the back, um, you know it has test ID. Well, obviously it's none because I haven't yet specified any test ID. Usually, when you write tests, you want to uniquely identify each test as you know this is my test or whatever, so that when you run it later and it fails, you can identify uh, which test it was that failed. Um, and if you scoot down further, you'll notice that, I mean, these two tests failed, obviously, because my expected output here was not given. I mean, it was null. If, if you don't mention anything, obviously, it takes it as a null. Um, I can quickly hit the replace output. Um, and uh, I can either rerun the test by clicking the button here. I can do a shift enter in the input uh, to quickly rerun the test. And uh, I might point out one thing is there is this test result bar this is dynamic. So whenever you run tests, that will be, and uh, you rerun tests, that uh, it will be dynamically updated in the test summary bar. I mean, that's my name for it. It's not the official name, but, um, and this helping thing has like a little tooltip. You can see what test it was. You can uh, quickly go to whatever test you want. But now notice that there is this actual messages. I mean, this reads actual messages for people who can't see at the back. Um, so here, for example, I have a test. This is, this is my input. This is what I was expecting. It matched. You can see in the details that, um, unfortunately, I can't make that bigger. Um, you know, my, expected, my actual and expected output are the same, but it's generating a message. And I can quickly uh, oops, click that one and rerun the test to see, you know, uh, to see it pass. Um, you can have several tests, and you, you might I might also point out that this has been updated here. Um, I can choose to uh, go through all the failures in the test. I mean, right now, there's just one failure in the test. So I can use uh, the buttons up here to navigate between failures, because most of the time when we write tests, we are interested in failures. Um, if you, um, right, so now if you have any inputs, for example, let's say, uh, Insert new input. I mean, you can copy this input from any regular, uh, uh, I know, 123 cubed. So this, this can be copied from any other notebook, or you can just create an input cell here. Um, and I mean, this is just like any regular mathematical notebook. But now I can convert this, this input and output into a test. I can do that by clicking the cell bracket and going to the mode button here. and using this convert selection to test. Um, that should convert it, to into, convert it into a test. And as soon as you run it, notice here that we have run a total of eight tests. Um, there'll, uh, one bar here got added. I'm not sure if you could see that. Um, but anyway, um, so it's a, it's a good notebook interface for, for quickly generating tests. Um, you could. Uh, you could do several other features, like assign test IDs. A lot of times, uh, you might want test IDs, unique identifiers for each of your tests. Um, 
Um, this, this button will uh, this button will add test IDs to all of your tests, um, all tests in the notebook. Now, here we are adding a UUID for each one of them, but you can customize it. Uh, for people who are interested in customizing it, I can show them how. But we haven't yet officially documented how to change it. Um, then uh, you can save this as a .wlt file. I mean, a lot of times uh, people complain that you know I want my tests tests in a text format because I want to save them somewhere, look at them with other editors. You can save it in a .wlt format. Um, gonna just save it as .wlt here. I already had it, so I'm just replacing it. Um, and then uh, let me also save the notebook. I'll be using the notebook later when I use when I show you some of the functionality. Um, and finally, you can add messages, add options. Well, obviously, this is we need to fix that issue, but I think it's only because of the slideshow mode and and the magnification. But anyway, this looks much nicer when you use it at maybe 100% zoom. Um, you can quickly add memory constraints uh, or you know time constraints. I'll, I'll go over all of these options in a moment. So. Um, so that's the uh, uh, so that's the notebook interface. So with the notebook interface, um, in, I mean, what we can do is start from a regular notebook, convert it into a testing notebook, run test there, play around there, uh, and then convert it into a .wlt file as a as a text format. Uh, for example, if you want to see how the .wlt file formats, you know, it's I'm just doing a file print on the on the file that we just saved. It sort of looks like this. I'll I'll go over what each of that stuff means. I mean, it's nicely formatted for you. The inputs, um, the expected outputs, the test IDs. Um, now, looking at the core functionality, which makes all of this happen. I mean, a lot of people here might just want to write tests, um, you know, uh, without using the notebook interface. Um, because they might want to programmatically access it and change it, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and it's best done in a text file, right? I mean, you might have a big text file. You might be uh, changing, or let's say your function was taking two arguments, and now it's taking an extra argument. And you want to programmatically do some, uh, you know, bring, bring all the data in and then do some replace sort of stuff to quickly update all of your tests. You could do that in a .wlt file. But anyway. Um, Looking at the verification test, uh, so this is the basic, uh, the core test which which runs um, which runs all the tests. So, um, I mean, this is like one of the most simple tests that you can think of. You know, like the hello world sort of thing to test. You know, uh, my input is one plus one, um, and it should evaluate to two. Uh, it produces one of these uh, nice typesetting. Uh, boxes, and you can see that my expected output was two, my actual output was two. It also tells you how much time it took to run the test. Um, if you look at the input form of it, you'll notice that there are several, it's, it's a test result object with an association in it. Um, each of these are what uh, what is called as properties. I mean, I can make it look a little better like this. So. Um, test index is sort of like an internal index of the order of tests that are run. Um, I mean, obviously, test IDs, the outcome, whether it was a success, it's a failure, or it's a message failure, what the expected actual outputs were, what the messages were, and how much time was used by the CPU or, and the memory used for that evalu evaluation. Um, so going a little bit more into detail about its options, properties, what you can do with this, um, it has three argument formats. Um, one is like a single argument format where it expects it the input to evaluate to true. So, oops. Um, if, for example, if you have one less than zero, then uh, you know it will be a failure. Um, you know, um, right? Sometimes you might have, for example, you might do an evaluation which will generate messages, and that's as expected. Uh, to account for messages, you can uh, account it in the third argument. Um, so this is the input, the expected output, and the expected messages. So without this, for example, notice that it's, it's a differently colored icon. And here, you'll, you'll see that the expected, expected messages was null, and yet you are generating a message. Um, 
going into some of the options. So we only support four options at the moment, although I think this technically supports about 23 options or 20, 20 odd options. But we officially support only four. Um, I hope to change that in, in the future versions. Um, but we are sort of very careful in looking at what we want to introduce in, as first class citizens in, in, in Mathematica. So uh, let's take a look at the same test. So a lot of times when we write the test, uh, we don't want to use um, same Q. So for example, when, um, when you do this test, what is being done is this input is evaluated and um, it will do a same Q of, of that and of my expected output. So that's, um, that's exactly what is going on internally. Although, I mean, you know, there is a little bit more stuff happening in the background. Um, but sometimes you might, you might not want to use same Q. I mean, you might want to use a different function because, you know, for, um, so for example, let's say you, you have this input and I just want to make sure that whatever this returns is an integer. So one way to do it is using match queue. So um, um, you know this is my input, my expected output, and my option is match queue. Uh, you can have you know different types of same tests. A good example is if you're dealing with uh, data, which is um, you know numerical. For example, there will be machine impression errors if you're running something which you know I don't know D solve and D solve, and it returns like this huge expression which has lots of uh, machine impression values in it. That those values will be different depending on which platform you run. There will be like my, minute differences. One way to account for them is, I mean, uh, you know, just do a chop between my expected output and my actual output, and then check to see whether it's a zero. Uh, obviously, you can come up with whatever type of test that you want to compare the outputs with, um, and the way you could do it is by using same test. Um, now, a lot of times when we run tests, we want to also make sure that they don't exceed a specific memory, uh, you know, especially useful in catching memory leaks, or uh, you know, they don't exceed a specific amount of time. Um, one way to specify that, for example, here, um, I have two uh, evaluations, range of five. I'm doing a byte count to see how many bytes it takes to store that expression in Mathematica. Now, um, if I have my memory constraint less than the amount. Notice here that 160 bytes are required to store this expression. So um, not sure if people can read it in the back, but uh, you know, here it will say that it's a failure because the current evaluation has exceeded the memory constraint. Um, however, if you increase the memory limit, you'll, I mean, the test will pass as expected. Um, this is often useful if you, if you are particular about, you know, um, about the performance of the functions that you're writing. You want to make sure that they don't take a large amount of memory or, or time. Um, now, test IDs, this is often useful. I mean, being in QA, I use this almost every time. Every, every time I write a test, I always put a test ID because I want to somehow identify that you know, this is the name of that test. Because when I, when I look at failures, as soon as I see the test ID, I want it to tell me something about you know, this is, this is what the test was. So um, you could use the test ID for that, and then the time constraint. Now for example, take a look at this valuation. Uh, takes about three plus seconds. Uh, it's a simplify on a uh, trigonometric fun function. Um, now if I give it obviously time constraint less than that, it's gonna fail, and you have nice looking, um, failure messages about time, uh, time, constraint, time constraint being exceeded. Now, take a little look at the properties it supports. So, fine, I have run the test. Now I want to extract things out of it. I, I want to see how much time it took to run the test. I want to see how much, what the expected output were, what the actual outputs were, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So these are the properties that each test result object supports. Um, I can, uh, you know, ask what's the test index, what's the test ID, um, you know, what's the amount of messages. You can view it, for example, here. Um, here, I'm taking this test was, was the one that I ran here. This, so this is my test, 
and now I'm uh, I'm applying each each property to that test to see what it returned. Oops. Um, okay, so we have looked at an individual test. Now I have a bunch of tests and. I want a function which will run all the tests and generate a report for me, right? I mean, most of the time, what we are interested in is after the test creation phase, we'll be using this to run all the tests um, every time, you know. Uh, test report, I think you can use in Cloud and, um, and Mathematica, but Wolfram, in, in the Workbench, you can just use the tools that you have already been using. I mean, all of this is supported in Workbench. And uh, all the tests that you have already written in Workbench should also be backward compatible. Um, so for example, test report can take a list of verification tests. Um, you know, here notice that, I mean, this is my hello world, and then I have purposefully not accounted for messages. Um, it will give you a short summary of the success rate, the tests that were run, and why they failed. There are four categories of failures that we or sorry, three categories of failures that we look at. Failed with wrong results, you know, wherein the, my actual output and the expected output just didn't match. Then failed with messages, wherein though my output, output was the same, it, it was giving extra messages. And then finally failed with errors. Now errors is sort of like our uh, fallback case whenever, for example, the test doesn't run. You know, you might be missing a brace in your, in your test option or whatever, and the test doesn't uh, run at all, then uh, it will fail with an error. Um, so this is the file that I had just saved. I mean, remember when I was going through the notebook interface, um, I saved the text file, and I can run the text file right away. It will give me the success rate, um, the tests that were run, failures, etc. cetera. I, w once I go through, go through the properties, I can show you how to interact with it to get uh, whatever relevant data that is desired. Um, and I can also run it using the testing notebook. So remember, we had two, two uh, ways to save tests. One is using the notebook interface, if you want to use that one, or converting into a plain text file. I mean, you know, depending on which school of thought you, you like. If you take a look at the input form of the test report object, you'll notice that it's a pretty huge thing. It's again an association um, of, of associations, actually. And it has, the, it has lots of... Uh, 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 I mean, it has lots of associate. It has the test results. It has the total time taken to run the entire all the tests together. Um, it has, you know, um, summaries that I'll extract in a moment. Uh, but before I get to that, I guess I'll quickly go over the options. Um, test report supports three options. I mean, all of these options should be pretty familiar because I just went over them in the previous slide. Um, now. Only the test ID is not supported because you know you don't usually want to have some sort of uh, test ID at a uh, test report level. I mean, it's sort of like a you know for all the tests. But sometimes you might want to have like all the tests. So you have written ten tests, but now you want to apply run the ten tests with a time constraint, or you want to run the ten tests with a memory constraint, or you want to run the ten tests with a uh, with a built-in uh, you know. Uh, built-in function to match the actual and the expected output. So for example, uh, this is a test wherein, for example, you have um, a test which is pretty simple, and then you also have a test which has some sort of uh, numerical imprecision in it. I mean, I've built in, uh, I've purposefully put in a uh, little difference here, and then I can write up my chop function to quickly you know, say that I care about 12 digits of precision after 12, you know, just just get rid of them, and then I can subtract them and see if if the if this returns true. So this one will make sure that both of them pass. If I have one more test, for example, and let's say I reduce the precision, wherein I'm oops, wherein I purposefully introduce um, the precision. Uh, I mean, obviously it will fail this test, and you can see that one failed with wrong results. Um, the memory constraint and time constraint is pretty similar. Um, you know, uh, this takes 900 bytes to run. Notice that in my verification test, I'm not accounting for the memory constraint, so I'm accounting for the memory constraint when I'm actually running the test using the test report function. So this memory constraint will be applied to all tests which were run by the test report. Now, 
Um, I can take a look at the test results and see that you know this indeed failed, uh, failed with, with the memory constraint. Um, now, notice here that I might have a test with a memory constraint specified gone. So this is your, I mean, this is the regular quantities that is supported. I mean, this is exactly like what you would expect out of, out of a Mathematica notebook interface. I mean, any, any quantity, any Wolfram Alpha stuff, you can just plug it in and everything should just work right away. Um, right, so um, I'll skip over the time constraint. Again, it's the same, same thing wherein uh, you have uh, a lot. I'm running over time, so I'll quickly go to the conclusion. So it, it has a lot of properties. You can query the properties to, um, to see how it behaves. And because I want to have questions from you guys, let me make a quick conclusion. So, this is our first step towards integrating testing into Mathematica. So it's not perfect yet, but it does give us a seamless transition from tests into a regular notebook to a testing notebook, and then save it as .wlt text files, which you can use anywhere. So they can be run, be it on Workbench, be it on Desktop, and be it on Cloud Products. It also has backward compatibility for tests that you might have already written using MUnit. And uh, what we plan to do in future is enhance different variety of tests. For example, maybe add performance tests, et cetera, et cetera. That's still under consideration. And uh, we want to support handling of special forms and typesetting. One of the drawbacks right now is a um, lot of the rich functionality in, in the notebook interface is not necessarily supported. 